So thank you all. Thank you, Clarice and Marcelo and George for, for, for this event. Um, am I starting saying that I may be more embarrassed than you all because I'm not a physicist nor a biologist. Maybe I'm like one third physicist and electrical engineer by, by education. And uh, so I'd like to try to show some some data for our group. I'm sorry, I didn't bring the faces of the people that help in that. Uh, but uh, at the end, I would like to to put an unorthodox uh, proposal on on the on the data I have. So let's start, and uh, I hope it goes. Oh, this is going slowly, but it's going. So just to to say where we are. Now we are now in, in Rio, but uh, University of Campinas in the Sao Paulo state. We have a campus in Limeira and Piracicaba. My campus is more one in, in Limeira city. I don't know why it's not going to the next point, but. So yeah, here is uh, Campinas in, in red, I'm sorry. So that, that is the main campus in, in Campinas, maybe you know that. And this is the small campus in Limeira. So here is the telecom. So I'm, I'm in the telecom engineer department. So you may ask me what, what I'm doing here. But uh, as I've got that position there, we are starting the telecom course, but they, they already had uh, a old course in um, environmental control. So tests to, to see about pollution and, and the environment. So I started this lab because most much cheaper than a telecom lab nowadays in, in photonics. So we have two uh, small homemade dark chambers on the upper left. And I don't know how, how it works. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. Oh, now it is. And, uh, yeah, it is basically a dark chamber with a PMT. So we put a sample here. We can control sample temperature if necessary, but the PMT is on uh, room temperature and then you, you see the signal in the computer. We also have uh, uh, those beautiful Hamamatsu machines, much more beautiful than the homemade. And we use uh, both systems. So just to say what we are talking about, we are, uh, in the past, people call it uh, biophoto emission, but then the name, many names for that, like ultra weak chemical luminescence, ultra weak luminescence, ultra weak photo emission. Now we are going to biological out luminescence that include like this small intensity emission, like spontaneous with no excitation. And also what we call delay luminescence when you excite the sample and then collect the light uh, comes coming out afterwards. So I got this from my uh, friend, Michal Sifra. Just, uh, I'm not expert on this, M much more. Many people here can expert than this, but we have many uh, uh, oxygen radicals that could emit an old entire visible. And that's we, we, what we use in, in those experiments. So just collecting the visible light that come coming out of uh, the sample. So in the late luminescence, we have some data on algae. So here it tests with some uh, toxic, I think, uh, herbicides that are used. So the idea is to shorten the make uh, ecological tests shorter. Usually they put algae, and the, after three days they they count how many algae reproduce or not. And here we can see after one hour that the lay luminescence is very different from the the control sample in in red here and the stressed samples, and th this is almost that. So the the healthier the the sample the bigger the 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 lay emission so we can use this uh, after one hour or three hours instead of uh, waiting three days to to count manually the the algae afterwards so this is done with that beautiful Hamamatsu machines but then back to the luminescence and seedlings there are a few beautiful images and this is one of the groups that can make 
beautiful women. Maybe uh, Gabrielle Camera can do some as well. So they shown that all the seedlings in development emits, but the, the bigger emissions are on the, on the place, at the tip and the base of the root and the leaflets. We don't have it here, but basically the places they are growing, they have metabolism accelerated somehow, naturally or artificially, we can detect more light uh, than the other places. This was discovered in the 50s. So uh, a nuclear physicist in Italy, so they put up thousands, hundreds of seeds, like several grams, like we did just under the PMT. So they, they were the first to show that this could happen. I got noticed this in, in Germany in a summer school, then I, I thought this could be used in a toxicological test because people use that with different solutions like fertilizers or toxic solutions and you put the seed and still grow and check how, how they grow. So if the signal is uh, related to, not to the growth and to the metabolism, that could be useful in agriculture, for example. So our first uh, publication was uh, 15 years ago with an undergraduate student. So this is what it looks like. You put like 15 wheat seeds. This is after germination. We, we see this, the, the, the rootlets and the leaflets. And this is a typical signal. You have like one day a decay, and then the seedlings start to grow. Even before they grow, you start to have uh, photon counting going up. This is dark count level down there. So we repeated with different uh, wastewater solutions, taking the uh, uh, wastewater concentrate, that bowl of shit, and making different solutions, maybe to see if it's toxic and how we can use as uh, like a fertilizer. And you can see here, uh, the control is down here. Then we have the dead samples and the ones that are going, growing more, emitting more. And then we did it for different, like Lestak, um, uh, Dichromate, Galvanic Inc., the important uh, polluters in, in, in Limeira, my city. So you can see here that we integrate the photon counts, like, like here in the first uh, day. The totem counts uh, quite linearly correlate with uh, the germination rate or the germination vigor, that's the, the size of the seedlings at the end. But you can see here that some, some points are out of the curve, mostly with the control, the control ones. And if you notice, all tests, they, they have these jumps. And if you notice more in detail that it's related to 12, 24 hours, like day jumps. Although the, the seedlings are in dark, store in dark and grow in dark. And we, we start to, to see that it, it were hard to compare groups that we germinate one after the other. We could compare better groups, uh, samples that were germinated in parallel, one in one chamber and the other in the other. And we thought, what the hell is that? So we still didn't make a, here is an example, very long uh, series of measurements showing that every sample has his own rhythmicity, but this varies uh, along the day, but also varies along the month. So we have like a fluctuation that goes every day and a fluctuation, a long-term fluctuation as well. What the hell is that? What the hell in nature that goes every day up and down and during the month? So I went after in the literature and you can find a lot of examples in the biology that follows what we call the gravimetric tide. So here's one of the first that, and, and I found in, in nature. So here are the three trunks, two, three, and here's the gravimetric tide. It's easy to calculate. It's something that repeats uh, always. And you can see they are quite similar in, in shape, isn't it? And I found many others like uh, tree potential, uh, seedlings hydration that are related to, to the gravimetric oscillations that we have every day. So we started to, to check that with our data, but we also collaborate with people. So we, we did measurements in, in Brazil, but also in Japan, in Hamamatsu, at their center of research here in, in Prague, Michal Sifra's 
lab in Czech Republic. And here in blue are the gravimetric tide of each place. And again, we, we start to see that all the inflections in the, in the photon count curves coincide with the peaks and the drops of the, gra the local gravimetric tide. So this pushes us to, to see that maybe there's something going on on that. So we have something related to that. So we repeated with different seeds and here a collaboration in, in Netherlands and, and Leiden. So in black is corn. Corn takes seven days to germinate. So you can see many cycles. And the other one is also corn, the green is wheat. So different, uh, some flower in red, different seeds, but you also can uh, see some, they go together. Like, like here, for example, like here, like the drops, different seeds, germinating in parallel, they do, although they have different shapes, but they do have some inflection that coincide between them and also with the, the, the gravimetric tide. And then in Brazil, we could make a measurement of single seedling of sunflower, just a big seed. Also, the sunflower take seven days to germinate to put the, the rootlets out. Here's just the, the last three days, but here we have from the beginning. So the first uh, three days, we don't have too much signal. Well, then you start to have jumps. And when we cut like day by day and superpose the jumps, you can see here in blue as the gravimetric tide and here in black is the photon count. So in the average of the, the three days here, and then this one is for, for this sample. Then I cut in uh, 24 hours. You see, the, here's this is like the uh, the half moon. So you have the, the, the tide not going in one peak, but uh, divided in two in the day. And you see that is something like similar in time. Three years ago, I was in, in Bristol on a sabbatical leave, and then we repeated the uh, test in triplicates. So we did uh, with wheat, with corn, in if mung beans, so small red beans. Again, to show this, that even in single seedlings, we could relate the uh, total count, the total photon count with the total length of seedlings. We take the seedlings and measure after the germination. So here's is just uh, the visual abstract, the, the seeds that didn't germinate at all in black, the red is the intermediate, and in blue, the one that really got bigger than the other. So the root lattice twice the other. So if we just integrate this curve and put against the, the seedlings development, we have quite a linear relation. Uh, we published that, but the time uh, profile is here. And then we improved the, the software for gravimetric calculations. We have here also not just the vertical component, but also the horizontal component then in the, in the Europe is much more pronounced than here. In Brazil, we are almost in the equator, so we have more the, the, the vertical component. But when you are in big latitudes, and uh, we have uh, the horizontal component as bigger as the vertical one. So we have some jumps that you see that they go together. In black is the photon counting, and in blue, the, the gravimetric tide. We have many jumps that goes really, really together with the tide. And we did the same approach, uh, cutting uh, in a day and superposing. So in blue is again the tide, and down here is the photon count. And then I made an average of all the all the data. So again, we have the you know, the tide in here and the photon counts. For, this is for wheat, and this is for corn. But not so clear. But still, we have some some indication that is going. Uh, together with the tide. We don't know how or, or, or why, but now we are convinced that maybe we have some circadian cycles that can be triggered by gravi gravimetric tide. This is uh, uh, like a strong statement. The people that work in chronobiology, they don't take care of all because they're all the genetic mechanisms involved. And uh, the thing that we, we, we think that we are controlling the environment in the laboratory, like temperature, uh, pressure, humidity, et cetera. You can block electro, electromagnetic forces, but to block the gravity 
is really hard. Are you you fall down or you go to to the the, the space? And actually, I don't have the data here, but people measure like plants evolving in, in the International Space Space Station. And this, the International Space Station do one, one turn in the Earth every nine minutes. So this, this slide is like every nine minutes and the plants also react. And that's so always an indication that maybe gravity could do some, play some role on, on, on this subject. So while I was in Bristol, I, some experiments failed, so we we, we decided to uh, do some uh, really uh, historic experiments that was uh, done in the beginning of the chronobiological uh, field is starting. There was uh, plant movement, so every bean grows, and when it's uh, mature, the leaves they open up and down every day. Even here is a continuous light. And uh, here's just uh, to see uh, when they are beginning. This plant is this one here, but here's just to show the, the fast movements of uh, the leaflet. Yeah, they they secundate and do faster. We repeat that for, for continuous uh, white light and also in training and also uh, counter phase in training. I don't show you all the data, but just one impressive here. So in blue is the tide and in green is the leaf, this leaf moving up and down. You'll see that it goes up and down almost with the tide. I have 10 repetitions of this. I can show you if you dub this data. And if you're doing training, if in training, if we day in an artificial day and light, of course, it will react with the artificial light, but it also goes up and down with the, the predicted tide in the area. So how is it? How, how could we guess? Maybe I'll jump. Uh, we have many, um, I was going to, yeah. So we have abnormalities in the earth for the gravity of the earth locally, but we also have uh, variation during the time. So here's the variation of the gravity because of water going to the Amazon region during the year from less or plus the, the, the average and this is going on and on all over. For those who don't uh, know what we're talking about, usually we, we think about the, the water type that are most common in, in our mind that the, the moon and sun uh, like taking the, the water where they are going. But we also have together with this, we have the earth tide. The earth cross always moves up and down. I didn't know that. But I was in Britain, the, the, the geophysicist that told me that if Scotland goes up and down 30 centimeters every day. So this, uh, this is a huge energy that comes to the earth and we don't know. So we have many, many components on that. So you can see here like uh, the 12 hours, 24 hours, and then the long years and more than year components. You can have vertical amplitude of 30 something centimeters or five centimeters and even the horizontal. So we don't notice that because it's a 12, 24 hour movement, but we are, we are shaking up and down and left, right. We all those modes, there are many, uh, many modes of motion. It's not just up and down. You see like pushing and all the modes we have in a sphere, you have in the earth as well. So the earth is always breathing with the tide. And this is for millions and millions of years. Why not? The biological living beings will not make be attached with that. So this is the argument of my, my friend in Bristol, that's a biologist, so to, to have some support. And, and even the, the CERN, when they turn on for the first time, they need to correct for the tide. The, the, the electron beam moves many mega electron volts because we have one millimeter change in the, in the ring that goes up and down, it's so big range. This is 20 something kilometer, isn't it? So this one millimeter is enough to, to and you need to correct the beam energy to, to know that it's not something else than the ring movement with the, the earth side. All this is just to, to push that, this is the big energy. It's similar, it's 10 to 20 joule per annual. It's similar to heat 
to radioactive decay, to tectonic and volcanic eruption. So this is an energy that is on the earth and is not small at all. Usually think that uh, that variation in the gravity is 10 to minus six of the average G that we have. Oh, you, you can say this is below the thermal vibration, but it's so coherent in this, the sense that it's always the same frequency and uh, the moon and sun are very predictable what they are. So it seems that some organisms should, should use that uh, too. So I try to, to get some things that could uh, make us understand that hydration is very, very, very important to many things. And I like to highlight here the molecular recognition and protein folding and unfolding. We have very different uh, physical uh, behavior in, in uh, microscopic components if we have more or less water. And more than that, if the water is like they call bulky water or is structured water around the, the biological the structures or the, all the molecules you have like a, a clad or like a, a vestment of water and you cannot uh, work without that. So maybe we could find something in that, that the water that make uh, interfacial and hydration water could make play a role and then maybe this is the, the way we could uh, find uh, the explanation for the biological cycles related to, to the gravity. So here's just more, more data I collect just to understand like electrostatic uh, repulsion is like uh, in membranes are fast with water or slow with without. And here like uh, clustering of waters uh, that you see that the water is not like random distributed around the, uh, the components we make like exclusion zones that the water behaves like, like a crystal, like it's solid around uh, the molecule. And uh, maybe this is one way to understand why the gravity would uh, interact with uh, the organisms. And uh, oh, time is over. And I'm finishing just another data. Uh, the group in, uh, in Kobe University that make uh, multivariance near infrared spectroscopy. They have a, a large data of uh, water controls because they need to compare a control with the water they are analyzing. So uh, I got this from a conference. The lady was relating to the moon phase that the, the control also varies. So uh, one put people put the moon phase, it, it looks like unscientific, but it's just a tide. Is a gravity force. So if you just skip the moon and put a force, maybe people will, will look for that with more energy. And uh, I'll thank you with an image. I think, I hope it op opens. Yeah. Thank you all for attention. Thank you.